I've done most of the things I need to ask you to Well, what that the D's are, it's, it's the excitement of, of science and research at a great place like Berkeley where people respect what can be done and are willing to support it. And even though I had no idea what was going to happen when I got there. It's one thing to conduct research in a lab in the comfort and familiarity of a world that is known to you. However, it's another thing to venture out into the world for scientific discovery. Five members of the faculty here at UC Berkeley have devoted their time, resources, and efforts to research abroad, each with the additional focus of humanitarian work. First, Patrick Vink and Fung Pham studied attitudes towards peace in the Republic of Congo. Second, Charles Briggs and his wife Clara Mantini Briggs looked at an outbreak of rabies in Venezuela. And finally, Marion Diamond worked with orphans in Cambodia. Last year, UC Berkeley researchers Patrick Vink and Fung Pham traveled to the conflicted eastern region of the Democratic Republic of Congo as part of a three-year research project for the Berkeley Initiative of Vulnerable Populations, led by the UC Berkeley Human Rights Center. Vink and Pham conducted a survey amongst the Congolese people and found that four out of five of the citizens who were surveyed considered themselves victims of violent acts sometime over the past 15 years. Rebel forces in the region have been accused of beatings, sexual violence, and interrogations, amongst other violent acts. Vink and Pham organized their findings into a report titled Living with Fear and sent it to the Congolese government and the United Nations. Pham acknowledges that reconstruction of the conflict-ridden region will be difficult, but most respondents in the survey were optimistic about the future. You were working to set up this health program. And indigenous leaders in the area approached us and said, we have a very acute problem, we need your help. People are dying from a 100% fatal disease. We have no idea what this is. We've been dealing with it for a year and you need to help us. So it was the indigenous community itself that had mobilized to confront a health disaster. So they sort of took us off the plan that we had to be able to work with them to figure out what this disease might be. We visited 30 communities in a short period of time in July and August. We soon determined that all of the symptoms in all of these communities were virtually the same. Dr. Martini Briggs, being a very good clinician, soon realized that all of the symptoms lined up perfectly with rabies. And I remembered that bats as well can transmit rabies. We found out, we started asking about bats and found out that m most of the people who had died had been bitten by bats, but of course had never received the vaccine which the World Health Organization suggests that is required when you've been bitten by a bat. Because um, many of them are aware and aware of, of the bite from the bat. We formed a research team and we went together throughout this entire area conducting our research. We came up with a report. We took this to the capital, Caracas, as a team. Uh, the government was not receptive, partly because it was a electoral period. There was um, a reluctance to accept the idea that people might be dying from rabies. We did our best to be able to suggest that this is a medical problem that had to do with people dying from the disease that had little to do with the electoral process going on in the government. The research in Cambodia began as an adjunct to my basic research, learning about how the environment changes the brain whether it's an enriched environment or an impoverished environment. And we've learned that when we put our rats in enriched environments, we increase the dimensions of the outer layers of the, the brain, the cerebral cortex. 
when we put them in impoverished environments, the cortex shrinks. So it's responding specifically to the input from the environment. After 40 years of working on brains with enriched and impoverished environments, I wanted to go to, these were rat brains, I wanted to go to human brains, and I wanted to find the most impoverished children I could think of. So I thought that landmine injured orphans would be about as impoverished as I could imagine and found out that they don't have landmine injury children anymore because people know where the landmines are and you stay away from them. But they said, do you want to work with just regular orphans? And I said, sure. So I went out into the forest at this Buddhist monastery where they allowed orphans to come live with them and they would give them food and, and lodging, as it was. <laughs> very, very primitive. They had no electricity, they had no running water, they had no bathrooms, and they lived out here in the forest. Well, consequently, after I've been there seven years now, enriching them, we have two of those. Uh, they were varied ages. Age didn't make any difference. One was 19, but had only uh, been in second grade. So I thought when I thought orphans, I thought I was going to have little tiny children, but I had a, a big range from 10-year-olds to 19-year-olds. And just this year, we have two who are entering college in Cambodia. We taught English and uh, computers to them, and they sort of rigged up car batteries to attach to the computers out in the forest, the most primitive conditions you can imagine see these little kids that have learned English, learned computers <laughs> out in the forest. I mean, it was a dream come true. And now to have two of them, I just received the uh, email yesterday saying that, uh, I mean, it's all done by email here. I can sit in my office and all semester long we communicate, but the man who's running it for me, the one who had lost his parents to the Khmer Rouge, he said he's got the two starting college, actually starting uh, college this week. Oh, so cool. well, because you do the lab where you can be precise, I can measure everything uh, and have controls and find that my data are real. If I say that the brain is changing, I'm comparing it with animals that have the same genetic background, they have the same food, they have the same conditions, only I'm changing the environmental input and that is significantly different. And I mean, it's statistically different, but if I go to Cambodia, I don't even, that's the dean was, said I had to have controls. I said, there's no way I can have controls. No two kids are alike, no two brains are alike, no two conditions are alike, anything. So I just went with what we could do from their progress, from when I started to what we achieved yesterday. This was a way of applying your um, research in enrichment and impoverished environments for rats on uh, like actual people then? Basically? Exactly. That's what it's for. I mean, it's wonderful to know that we can enrich rats, but to translate it so humans can benefit from it. I mean, you look at this through much of research. They start with finding out a gene or DNA or whatever with their animals, and then the beauty of transferring it so everybody benefits. How long do you think you'll continue doing this work in Cambodia then? Well, as long as I'll be their advisor as they move on. I'm not going to continue to give it my full attention as I have. I want to let them take over and have a transition now. Well, the beauty of doing basic research is being able to quantify the results precisely so you can transfer it to benefit humanity. That's essentially what you're after.